Here's our homework, the first homework set, which is a review. All of this is a review. Uh, let's see, this week is a review of beginning algebra, what you would have learned, it, the very basic stuff you would have learned in beginning algebra and then moving on with um, what you learned in intermediate algebra. OK, and then we'll we'll be on and off reviewing intermediate algebra all semester long as it becomes applicable to college algebra. All right. So we're going to talk about functions. They're probably the most important topic in mathematics today, and actually for the last hundred years. <laughs> Here we're being asked about a series of graphs, and this is the way you first learned about functions. We're being asked, is this the graph of a function? 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 <clears throat> and it's just a yes or no question. And I already have the answers here, so you can see the answer is yes for this. But I need to tell you why, because you won't have the answers uh, when you do your homework. There, that's good. OK, I want the, the color to be red, though. Yeah. Um, the quick and easy, the dirty way to figure out if a graph is the graph of a function is to use the vertical line test. Remember that and you draw or you imagine drawing a vertical line through the graph. usually at a couple of different points. So like here and here, you don't have to be careful. And here, it's just good to have it at more than one point. All right, here's what the vertical line, line test teaches you. So I'm gonna write vertical line test. Use vertical line test. If this line crosses the graph and touches the graph at only one point everywhere on the graph, then what you've got is a function. And notice that, that no matter where I draw a vertical line here, that vertical line will touch the, uh, the graph at only one point. Heck, it's a function. Yay! I better meet people. See, somewhere I've got a mute all button. I wonder where it is. Well, it looks to me like everybody's muted. OK. Now, we have a different, a different deal going on with this graph. I've drawn relatively vertical lines through the graph, and notice that my vertical lines touch the graph at two points. Not one, but two. Now, on the other hand, if I had drawn a line through this point, it would say, well, you only intersected the graph at one point, which is why I need multiple points, or at least I need to imagine that I'm drawing vertical lines through more than one point. Because even though if I draw a line here, or if I draw a line here, 
the vertical line will go through the graph at only one point. Here goes through two. So the answer is no here because the vertical line intersects the graph at more than one point. Let's write that down. For people who have come in a little later, we are reviewing. I know that you all already know this, but review is good. Uh, the vertical line intersects the graph at more than one point. I heard someone say something, I thought. But again, I don't see that um, anyone is unmuted. I am glad to answer questions as we go along, but all I heard was something that was garbled. I couldn't make any sense out of it. If someone is asking a question, I am glad to respond to it. Or, let me show you this. Here's chat. So if I cannot understand your question, put your question in chat. I'll, I'll read it after the meeting and get back to you. Okay, here we have a vertical line that does the same thing. If I had drawn the vertical line here, of course, it would intersect the graph at only one point, but over here and at other places on the graph, uh, the graph intersects, uh, the vertical line intersects the graph at more than one point. So no, again, the vertical line, the VL, intersects graph at more than one point. OK, but why? I mean, in math, we don't usually go around just showing pictures. I'll tell you in a minute. Let's do this. OK, this looks for all the world like it could never be a graph. But but if you draw a few of these vertical lines or semi vertical lines. Through the graph, you'll see that, well, these vertical lines are indeed intersecting the graph at only one point. So even though this looks incredibly complicated, like it could never be a function, it is a function. It passes the vertical line test. That is a vertical line intersects the graph at only one point. Uh, intersects. Graph at only one point. OK, so I am. Yeah. In a minute. I, I was going to save it. So let us go to your class actually and save it in your class. There. All right, so let's talk about why, 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 why. Let's get technical for a minute. 
let's look at this vertical line right here. Right here. Let's see, this point, the point of intersection is the point. Let's see, you go one to the right, and one, two, three, four, five, six up. So this is the point one, six, and it, um, it matches up with one on the x-axis and six on the y-axis. In mathematics, we talk about mapping. What functions do is they map. Functions map x coordinates to y coordinates. Um, this particular PDF editor is hard to write on. Um, the one that I'll, I'll use for the next homework set is uh, neater, much neater, much easier to read. Um, okay, so over here, the number one on the x-axis is being mapped to the number six. Let me make this much bigger. one is being mapped to six and where the mapping occurs is right here at this point one six okay over here one two negative one negative two negative three negative four negative five this is negative six on the x-axis one two three this is three on the y-axis so this point see look at that six that is a sick six oh good all right let's try that again six okay that makes this point negative six three which means the number negative six is being mapped to three at that point right there. And it's the function, the graph, that's doing it. There's no confusion. Negative six is definitely being mapped to three. Positive one is definitely being mapped to six. I know exactly where number one goes, I know exactly where negative six goes. Now, and that makes a function. Come over here. Here's one, two. Here's two on the x axis, right here. Two is being mapped to whatever that y coordinate is up here. Um, let's say it's one, two, three, point eight. Let's call it 3.8, okay? So two is being mapped to 3.8. I just made that up, of course. Need more room. Ah, but 
two is also being mapped to whatever that number is. Negative one, negative two, negative three, it kind of looks like negative three and a half. So, two is being mapped to negative 3.5, which is three and a half. Now tell me, where is two going? Is it going to 3.8 or is it going to negative 3.5? Where can I find it quickly? That's why this is not a function, because there's confusion about what is happening, where two is being mapped. Is it going to New York City or to California? Well, there is absolutely no confusion here. One is being mapped to six, no problem. Down here, I don't know which one to, uh, to say two is being mapped to. It's being mapped to two different Y coordinates at the same time. So it's not a function. That's why, if you were interested. Okay, the rest of this is little math stuff that we're gonna actually do with functions. Which is why it's kind of important to have a function. We're going to evaluate functions. This is called evaluating. It's something we do with functions a lot. Functions are formulas. E see, evaluate. Okay. Here we have h of x equals 2x. Remember h of x f of x, b of x, z of x. They're all just ways of writing y. So you could just write this y equals 2x. But more and more, you're going to be writing using function notation, and this is called function notation. And remember you say H of X. It doesn't mean that H is being multiplied by X. It means that Y is being calculated for a particular X. All right, and here are the particular X's. What is H that is Y? Y and H are the same thing. What is Y when X is negative four? What is y when x is 17? What is y when x is 29? And or, better yet, to what number is negative four being mapped by the function h? To what number is 17 being mapped by the function h? To what number is 29 being mapped by the function h? Here's how you get these answers. H of negative four equals, well, let's write what H of X is first. H of X equals two times X. So H of negative four is two times negative four, which is negative eight. And H of 17. 17 in the parentheses means that 17 gets mapped to that set of parentheses right there. 2 times 17 is 34. That's how they get that answer. Now, H of 29 is two times 29. And so two times nine is 18. 
carry the one, two times two is four, plus one is five, and that's how you get 58. We have evaluated h of x for negative four, for 17, and for 29. Don't you feel good? We're going to do more evaluating now. Here we have a function k of x. It's just a function. And what this means is y equals 8x plus 4. So how do I evaluate for x equals 6? Well, k of 6 is going to be The 6 goes in where the x is. Over here, k of negative 1. Negative 1 gets put right here, where the x was k of 6.8. I'm going to have to finally drag out my calculator, maybe. I take 6.8, I put it in here. Okay, well, 8 times 6 is 48, right? Plus 4 is 52. 8 times negative 1 is negative 8. I should be writing that down. Negative 8 plus 4 is negative 4. And because you want to remember your order of operations also, you multiply and divide before you add and subtract. So 8 times 6 is 48 plus four is 52. Okay, now this, well, I mean, we could do this. Eight times eight is 64. It, nah, let's, it's time, it's time, let's do it. All right, where is my calculator? There it is. This is the TI Smart View, and you can get it for 90 days um, free from TI if you go to the Texas Instruments website. Um, or, or type in TI Smart View. I'm about to run out of my free subscription, so I'm going to hope I can re-up again. They let, re, let me re-up free a second time. Use your uh, NWAC email to do it, because they're doing this free to students and teachers. Okay. So what am I doing here? This is going to be 8 times 6.8 plus 4. Let's make this big and clear it. OK, now watch. I love the TI calculator. 8 parentheses 6.8 parentheses closed plus 4. And then enter which gives me 58.4. Let's see what their answer is. 58.4, yeah. So yeah, you can do it on your calculator. Now, okay. <clears throat> I suppose we should do this on the calculator 
just to uh, uh, get you used to it, but I kind of hate to do that. All right, f of zero. Well, if f of x is two times x squared minus three x, then f of zero is going to be two times zero squared minus three x. And f of negative one is going to be two parentheses squared. It's just the x that's being squared. So whatever goes in the parentheses will be squared, but not the two. Oops, look what I did. There, because I have two X's now. Okay, so I put negative one in <clears throat> for the X's, but it's especially important, especially if you're gonna use your calculator, to make sure that negative one is in parentheses. I just always put numbers in parentheses when I'm plugging them into functions. Okay, F of two. equals two parentheses squared minus three parentheses. Now I put the two in and the two in. All right, so there's a technicality that some of you may know and some of you don't, but there's really no, well, zero squared is something very special in math. We're not going to talk about it here. If you've had calculus, you know about it. Um, but we just think of it as being zero, so don't worry about it. Here you're going to have two times zero, um, zero squared, which you can think of as being two times zero, which is zero, minus three times zero, which is zero, so you'll have zero minus zero, which is zero. Here, very important. Negative one squared is negative one times negative one. So let's write it down the way it is. Two times negative one times negative one. Minus three times negative one. Negative one times negative one is positive one. This is if you're doing it by hand. Two times one minus three times negative one. You've got a negative three there. You're multiplying by a negative one. That will give you a plus three. So two times one is two plus three is five. Let's put it in the calculator because negative numbers are probably safer to do in the calculator. OK, so let me see what this is. I'm going to type it in and then I'll make it bigger for you. Um, two parentheses, negative one, close parentheses, and then squared. I'll go over the uh, keys I hit, minus three parentheses, negative one, parentheses closed. OK, here are the keys that I hit. This is two left parenthesis. I typed negative one by not hitting the minus sign, instead hitting the negative sign. This is used to make a number negative. This is used to subtract a number. All right, so this number is a negative sign. This number, uh, this, this dash is a negative 
This dash is a negative. That dash is a minus. You have to be careful. All right, so I have two parentheses, negative one, parentheses closed squared, minus three times negative one with parentheses around it. I hit enter and I get five. So sometimes, especially with negative numbers, it's safer if you use parentheses to actually put it in the calculator. And then what have I got? Well, this is going to be two times four. This is two squared, which is four. Minus three times two, that's minus six. 2 times 4 is 8, minus 6, that's going to be 2. Let's see if that's right. And in this class, you've always got the option to use your calculator. Discussion about this. Or about this before we go on. Again, we're reviewing stuff you did in beginning algebra. You first learned about functions in beginning algebra, which is the same as algebra one. Uh, the function A of S given by this function right here can be used to calculate the average age of employees uh, between the years 1981 and 2009. Let A of S be the average age of an employee, they already said that, and S be the number of years since 1981. That is S equals zero for 1981 and S equals nine for 1990. This is a very common way to calculate time. And you're going to see that it's used over and over and over again. We don't use the year, but we state, OK. Our um, our calculations started in 1981. Therefore, 1981 is going to be year zero. Which makes 1982 which is one year after 1981, it makes that year one. And so on and so forth, 1983 is uh, three, eight, three. 1983 is two years after 1981, so it becomes year two. And since in this problem, the author of the problem has decided to use the letter S to mean years after 1981, when the study started, uh, that's how we get S equals zero for 1981, S equals one for 1982, S equals two for 1983. And then they go ahead and they tell us that 1990 using that system is going to be year nine, which is S equals nine. Cool. Now, the average age of employees in 2003 is, and we're not supposed to know these. So here's how you figure it out. 2003, is going to equal, well, 2003, let me change the equals to a minus. 2003 minus the start year, 1981, is going to be, well, um, get your calculator and say 2003 minus 1981. Whoa. 
2003 minus 1981. It's 22 years. Cool. Is going to be year 22. Which means we'll have S equals 22. So what does that mean for us? That means that this first question is going to be calculated by putting this in my calculator 0 0.295 times 22 plus 58. Okay. So 0 0.295 times 22 plus 58. Let me make sure that's right. I don't trust myself. 0 0.295, yes, times 22 plus 58. And there it is right there. That's the time symbol. It's what you get when you click on times. 64.49. How did they get 64? Because there are instructions here also. You have to be sure to read those instructions or you'll get the problem wrong. If I had answered 64.49 and put that into my math lab, it would have said I was wrong. And why would I have been wrong? because I didn't read the other instructions. There are instructions usually in two different places in my math lab. You have them on top, which are the general instructions, and then you have them underneath each answer box. So round to the nearest whole number as needed. Ah, you're gonna have to round. Okay, well, let's look at 64.49. Here's the whole number part. The number immediately to the right of that is a four. A four is not large enough to round up this four to a five. Therefore, I just drop off the 49 and my answer is 64. You're going to have to remember your rounding rules. You're going to be rounding a lot, and people lose lots of points on tests by not rounding correctly. At college algebra, you're expected to know how to round. Not in pre-algebra, but now after all these years of math, yes, you got to be able to round. Okay, now. Enough of that. Okay, now we're going to look at the average age of employees in 2009. 2009 minus 1981. Whoop. 1981 equals. Two zero zero nine minus nineteen eighty one. Well, that gives me a nice round twenty eight. Ah, right, duh. That's going to be S equals twenty eight. So I come over here zero point two nine. 5 times 28 plus 58. So 0 0.295 times 28 plus 58. 
make sure that's right. Yeah. So there it is larger. It's down here. And I'm going to hit enter. And I get 66.26. This says the same thing. Round to the nearest whole number, 66.26. Here's the whole number part. The, uh, the decimal expansion is what it's called. This is the fraction part. 66 is your whole number part. You look over at the two. Two is not large enough to make six go up to a seven, so your answer is 66. Now, what number would have made 66 go up to 67? And the answer is if this number had been five, six, seven, eight, or nine. That would have caused 66 to be 67. But it wasn't, so it didn't. Okay, the thing you wanna learn from this is, yeah, yeah, you're gonna have to round, but in particular, in grown-up math, in science, and in business, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, years are calculated like this, like this, where 2009 is really year 28, which means you have to know what year you started with. OK, so you will get used to this as we go through the semester. Discussion about this problem before I go on. You can unmute yourself and say something if you want to, or you can type your question in the chat. I'll read the chat when we're done and I will respond. I'll email you. I'll email you in Canvas. I have, I have a question. Sure. So this, so this is showing us sure sure what this is for our notes. Our note. Yes, okay. yes, these these notes will be put into module one. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. You're welcome. They're not exactly artful. The next set will be better. Okay, people have all kinds of problems with this problem. Here we have a function P of D equals one plus D over 33, which gives the pressure in atmospheres, ATM is just how it's measured, pressure in atmospheres at a depth D in the sea, where D is in feet. So, a little picture could help. We have a red sea there. Oh dear, maybe a red tide. And we're talking about the number of feet below the surface of the ocean. Pressure is measured in something called atmospheres. And this is the function that describes it. So however many feet you are below the surface of the ocean, you just plug that in there for the D. Now they give you extra information here, which um, I think only complicates things. It says note that P of zero equals one atmosphere. Well, P of zero means you put a zero in for D. So you'll have one plus zero over 33. 0 over 33 is 0, so 1 plus 0 is 0, so it's 1. And P of 33 is 2 because you'll have 1 plus 33 over 33. 33 over 33 is 1, so you'll have 1 plus 1, which is 2. Well, what they want us to do is find the pressure at 90 feet. 
horse of a different color. Okay, P of 90, or P evaluated at 90, equals 1 plus 90 over 33. And they want the answer as an integer, which is a whole number. An integer can be a positive whole number or a negative whole number or a simplified fraction, which means you've, you've broken the fraction down as much as you can. Now, one of the really good things about your calculator is, let me clear all this, I am going to do the following. One plus 90 divided by 33. Now, if you hit enter, you get that nasty decimal. How are you going to answer that with a fraction? But your calculator takes care of that for you. If you click the math button, then right there at the top you have frac, which means fraction. So all you have to do is hit enter and enter again. And there's your answer, 41 over 11. It's an improper fraction, but it's still completely simplified. It's completely broken down to lowest terms. In algebra, we prefer fractions like this to mixed numbers. So remember that. 41 over 11. And that's how they get this answer. So what was that you had? You had something. What was the answer? 3.72727272. Notice it's a repeating decimal. Repeating decimals can always be converted into fractions. That's going to be important later. Okay, and we're going to do this problem and then take a break and come back for the second homework set. Uh, this function, W of D equals 0 0.112 times D, approximates the amount in centimeters of water that results from D centimeters of snow melting. OK, so you've got snow. Which means you have to have a snowman. Or a snow person. Then you got right the carrot nose, got a top hat. All that kind of stuff. Um, OK, so you've got this much snow on the ground. I always like to draw a picture. Um, the water that results from D centimeters of snow melt. All right, so if you've got D centimeters of snow melting, there. So that's what the D would be. D centimeters of snow melt. Now find the amount of water D that results from snow melting from a depth of 12 centimeters, 39 centimeters, and 88 centimeters. All right, let's read it again. W of D is the amount of water that results. The use of words is very important here to know what you're looking for. The amount of water that results from D centimeters of snow melting. But that's the important part right here, because look what they're asking. Find the amount of water that results. OK, 
we're going to be looking for W of D and they're giving us D. So that makes life a lot easier. We're told what W of D is. Let's write it down here and then I'll scroll up. W of D equals 0 0.112 times D. And they're saying, OK, well, let D equal. D equals 12. Well, that means we're going to look for W. W of 12. And D of 39. I mean, D equals 39. And D equals 88. OK. So we are going to put in the calculator 0 0.112 times 12, 0 0.112 times 39, and 0 0.112 times 88. Yes? Oh, I just saw a terrible sight. We've got more to do. But not a whole lot. Um, OK, all right. Now, calculator. So, 0 0.11. Two parentheses, 12. And then I'm going to sh show you a shortcut. Probably already know it. OK. 1.344. Yes, I'm always glad. All right, now. I can type all of that over again and then change that to 39, or I can do this. Push the second key and the enter key. That makes the whole thing reappear. I can back up with my left arrow key. And then hit the delete key twice. And then type 39. But I'm going to have to retype. The parenthesis. I'm less likely to make a mistake if I do that. And then 88 is the last number, I believe. So I'm going to go second, enter. Back back, back, delete, delete, 88, close parentheses, enter. There are my three answers. Now all I have to do is see if they match up. Yes, they do. Now these steps are going to be on the video, so you'll see how to do this. So you would put 1.344 here, 4.368 here, and 9.856 here. Discussion about this.
OK. Now these are. Some of these are pretty easy. The graphs are. I assume you can already read a graph, but just in case you have trouble with this or you need review, the graph shown below approximates the number of children in a country who lived with only their grandparents in the years from 1991 through 2009. Now they're explaining the graph, which you can see. The years are on the bottom, and the number of children in millions is going up the Y axis. The number of children is a function F of the year X. That is how many kids there are living with grandparents is generally increasing by the year. So in a way you can say the year causes the children, more children to be living with their grandparents. Not really, but mathematically it would be true. Approximate the number of children living with only grandparents in 1991. All right. Let me make this bigger. What we're going to do is first find 1991 here on the X axis, go up to the graph and then go over to the Y axis and we see 1.3. So the answer would be 1.3 million children in 1991 in this made up country were living with only their grandparents. Which is how they get the answer. You would answer 1.3. And then they have the word million. This is really an answer box on my math lab. So you would type 1.3 in the answer box. And the word million is already written for you, so you don't need to write 1.3 million. This is just a little practice reading a real life graph and not just a, a made up kind of graph. Well, except it is made up. The following graph approximates the number of pharmacists in a country in the years from 2002 through 2012. The number of pharmacists is a function of the year. That means you go to the year first. Approximate the number of pharmacists in 2005. OK, so this is the number of pharmacists in thousands. And this is the year, and we're looking at 2005. So here, this is 2002, 2004, 2006. 2005 must be right here on the x-axis. You go up to the graph, okay? Go over to the y-axis, and we have 240. So I bet the answer is 240. Thousand. And they wrote the thousand. So you only have to write 240. Now, before we go on, this is mapping. Do you see that here? Let's see. This is one, two, three. 4. 2005 is year 4. You don't have to know that, but it's being mapped by the graph. That means it's being connected by the graph, that point on the graph, to the y axis. That's what functions do. They map X coordinates to Y coordinates. And each X coordinate gets mapped to its own Y coordinate, not to more than one Y coordinate, or it's not a function. Now we're going to talk about domain, and this is a little more difficult. S 
So back in beginning algebra, you learned about polynomials, and then you discussed them more in intermediate algebra, that is in algebra one and algebra two. This is a polynomial. I know it's a polynomial because there is no denominator. No square roots. No fraction exponents. Remember a fraction exponent means you have a root. In fact, I hope you even recognize that this is just a straight line that looks something like that. You could graph it and you could see exactly what it looks like. So, polynomials all have the same domain. Other things can be different, but polynomials all have the same domain. And that is all real numbers. All real numbers is another way of saying the entire X axis. Okay, the domain is the source of all of the X coordinates that can be used in the function. So we, I need to write that even though it won't be so neat. Domain is source of all numbers. That that can be used, that are allowed to be used, that can be used. That's easier. That can be used as X coordinates. Okay, now let's look at this. Use the graph to find the following. OK. And then it's going to ask us about the domain. So F of zero equals what? Remember, this is the question. I printed this with all the answers, but you don't know this going into it. F of zero. This is always going to be the X coordinate. This is going to be the X coordinate where the graph is when you're asking about the Y coordinate. So we go to X equals zero, which is right here, right? This is two, this is one, this is zero, this is negative one x equals negative 1. So this is x equals 0 right here. Right in the center. What this question is asking you is what is y when x is 0? So you go to the point on the graph 
at x equals zero and you say, oh, well, well, why is zero there? In fact, at the very center called the origin, x is zero and y is zero. But you can tell just by looking. Y equals zero at every point on the x-axis. And then here y is one, y is two, y is three, y is four. So f of zero equals zero for this particular graph. It's not always going to be true. Now, what is the domain? The domain is always left to right. It's not the up or down. Range is the up or down. Actually, it goes down to up lowest to highest, but I'm not trying to be official right now. Down to up. Okay. So I could say this graph goes up forever and down forever, and I can tell by the, the arrows. However, if I'm being asked about domain, I don't care what it's doing up or down. I care about left to right. Notice that as this graph goes mostly up, it's also tilting out to the right, and that's going to keep going forever and ever and ever. And as the graph is going down, it's also tilting out to the left. So eventually, this graph is going to match up with every point, every point on the x-axis. The entire X axis is going to be its domain. And remember that the X axis goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. So we come back over here. <clears throat> Again, it says all real numbers. You've only got real numbers on the X axis. You've only got real numbers on the Y axis. Is there any such thing as unreal numbers? Yes, you learned about that in Algebra 2, in Intermediate Algebra, the I numbers. Okay, the complex number system. But our graphs are in the real number system. And so the only numbers you're going to see on either the X or the Y axes are real numbers. So since this graph goes to the left forever and the right forever, I can safely say the domain is all real numbers. But what that means is the entire X axis which can also be written as negative infinity to positive infinity. There are different ways to write these things. Now it says find all of the X values such that F of X equals two. What are they saying? What they're saying is, forget f of x, they're saying y equals two. If y equals two, what x values is that true for? Oh no, let's look. All right, they want y equals two. Here's y equals two. If I draw a horizontal line through y equals two, I intersect the graph at this point. So let me see what x-coordinate that matches up with. 
It's two, X equals two. Okay, so Y equals two matches up with X equals two. And that's what we have here. That's how they got that answer. And that is the meaning of an ordered pair. Points are called ordered pairs. And so they're written like this, where you've got an X number and then a comma and a Y number. So Y is the number that you get on the Y axis when X is a certain number and the other way around. So here what two two means is that if Y is two, X is two. If X is two, Y is two. What is the range? The range goes lowest to highest. Well, this graph goes up forever and down forever. It's going to cover the entire Y axis. So it's all the real numbers again. The entire Y axis, which can also be written as negative infinity to positive infinity, but it's a different negative infinity to positive infinity from the uh, from the X axis. This is the Y axis. OK, and you have more of these, but let's do this because it's a little more complicated. This is the graph of the absolute value, just so you know. You're going to see it. This is the graph of Y equals the absolute value of X, but it's shifted. Okay, so use the graph to find the following. What is F of two? What that means is you go to two on the X axis. You go up to the graph. And then over to the Y axis and you get four. So F of two is four. And what that means is you've got the point two, four on your graph. This is the point two, four. Okay, what's the domain? This graph goes to the left forever and to the right forever. So the entire X axis is the domain. In other words, the domain is all real numbers. The entire X axis. Which can also be written as negative infinity to positive infinity. Now it says for what X values is F of X equal to one? F of X equal to one. What is that? Oh, for what X values is Y equal to one? What we do is we go to y equals one, which is right here, and draw a horizontal line. Now 
Notice there are two numbers on the X axis that match up with Y equals one. Here, five. And here, seven. Which means this is the point five, seven, and this is the point, uh, I mean, this is the point five, one, and this is the point seven, one. I don't really have room to write it. Maybe I do. Five one seven one. So that's why the answer is five and seven. Notice how they write it. They don't put parentheses around it. That would say you've got a point, the point five seven. That would be totally wrong. You're listing the X coordinates that match up with the Y coordinate one. And what is the range it's asking? Aha, now. This graph does not go down forever. It only goes down as far as the X axis, and then it starts going back up. So the part of the, of the Y axis that is the source for all the Y coordinates of all the points on the graph, the range, starts at y equals zero, which is what the x-axis is, and then goes up forever. So there are two ways to write it. The most customary way to write this range would be interval no notation, which would be bracket, zero because y actually equals zero to positive infinity. However, what we have over here is the other way the other way to write um um um, um domain and range or any kind of interval and that is set builder notation. That's what this is called. Okay, so um, it's not all real numbers. Instead, you're going to have y equal to or greater than zero because in this graph, y is equal to zero or all numbers greater than zero. But no negative numbers, which is why the answer is not all real numbers. Oh, it just keeps going on. All right, but we are only going to do one more. Maybe two more. Just real fast, what is the domain of this function? Rule, very important rule. The denominator of a function cannot equal zero.
Here you've got the denominator of a function. You have to make sure it doesn't equal zero. So X minus two cannot equal zero. Well, solve this just like you would solve a regular equation. Add two to both sides. Negative two plus two is zero. You're left with an X on the left, not equal to positive two. You could do this in your head, by the way. What number for X will make X minus two equals zero? You could just look at that and say, well, if X is two, you're gonna have two minus two, which is zero. That means X can never be allowed to equal two if you're working with this function. So, we pick. X can be any real number except two. Two is the only troublemaker. So that's why this is the answer right here. X can equal zero. If X is zero, you'll have zero minus two, which is negative two. There's nothing wrong with the number negative two. It's the whole denominator, X minus two, that cannot equal zero. Okay, one more, one more, and then we take a quick break and go on to the rest of the homework. So again, we have a denominator that could equal zero. We have to guard against it being zero. Why? Because it says find the domain. Hello? Find the domain. Okay, X minus seven X is the denominator and it cannot equal zero. So eight minus seven uh, X cannot equal zero. I will solve this by adding seven X to both sides. Negative seven X plus seven X is zero. That leaves me with an eight cannot equal seven X. 0 plus 7x is 7x. Now, to solve for x, this is 7 times x. I have to do the opposite of multiplication, which is division. 7 over 7 cancels, and I'm left with x equals 8. x cannot equal 8 sevenths. So now we start reading these. Uh, X is a real number and X cannot equal zero. What would happen if X was zero? You'd have eight minus zero. Seven times zero is zero. You'd have eight minus zero, which is eight. No problem. So this is not correct. X can, uh, X can only be numbers greater than eight sevenths. What about negative two? I mean, that would be positive 14. Eight plus 14 would be 22. You'd have three over 22. Nothing wrong with that. So this won't work. Where do they get three? Good grief. Now, this is your answer right here. X is all real numbers, or X is a real number a number on the x-axis, but not, definitely not eight sevenths, which is what we got here. 